if you get architects, architects they design houses and and so on. They're using mathematics all the time. When they come up with something new, the mathematicians say, yes, that's our domain. So we're now in charge of designing houses as workers. It all depends on mathematics. So because mathematics is fundamental to everything, mathematicians can always have claim an interest in everything, which is correct in a way. Uh, the question is whether we can actually design games, structure games in such a way that we can kind of learn particular types of knowledge in particular domains. So there's a whole series of, the whole class, classification of games called serious games, where you might learn how to, I don't know, operate an emergency ward in the hospital. That's, that's, a, that's a game. And uh, these are tremendously uh, important uh, developments currently. Um, and perhaps we can think along the same lines to some extent of what we're doing, because we're playing games, small games, but games that will help to solve what solve problems and help people to think about things. Okay, so I have run many, many classes because I, I used to teach, uh, well, I'm a trainer for Chester Schools and Communities and I, teach, I taught many teachers about uh, how to teach chess. And uh, I would say to them, okay, tell me, hands up, uh, what are the main benefits of uh, chess? Uh, what are the connections be ch between chess and mathematics? And more or less, this is what they say. Uh, it's about problem solving, concentration, planning, logical analysis, finding the best answer, pattern recognition, uh, the coordinate system in, uh, in geometry is a good one, uh, mental arithmetic, if you're playing chess, you're kind of thinking. Uh, all chess players know about the queening square, which is a simple geometrical concept. Uh, you have to count when you play chess, you have to count moves, you have to count the number of pieces attacking a, a point or defending a point. Uh, when you exchange pieces in chess, you have to do a fundamental calculation. Um, and it, it's also observed, of course, that many children are good at both chess and they're good at mathematics. Uh, it's often, often the case that the, the Mathematics Olympiad team, the, the school junior Olympiad team, are also the chess team in, in some schools. There's very much an overlap. Uh, we don't know why that is, but uh, we notice this in England anyway. Um, okay, so there are some many, many connections between them. So you might have thought that we could do some, I don't know, more explicit uh, activities combining chess and mathematics. But it turns out to be not quite so easy. Um, but at least what we've got going for us is that, um, first of all, there are many maths problems that look very nice on the chessboard. So let's use those. That's an easy win. And uh, we can also take advantage of the fact that children love playing chess. And when we say playing chess, it doesn't mean they have to be very good at it, they just love it. You know, it's just a game, it's a nice game, lovely game, have fun. And once you have that, once you have acceptance by the children that they want to play the game, then you can kind of say, well, let's do this little problem, or let's do that little problem. Then you can kind of teach them things. This is the, uh, this is the approach. Um, so game-based learning, as we say, mathematical games are fun. And I mean, it's very interesting uh, when, as part of this project, we visited uh, Lisbon and George took us to see the National Mathematical Games uh, competition, which uh, includes something like, starts with 100,000 children in Portugal, something extraordinary. And they came to this huge uh, like sports centre and to see the enthusiasm of the children, and they're all playing board games, they were using clocks, or no, less than them, not all of them were using clocks, only a few actually, but they were using the Swiss system, which is what we use in chess. It looked exactly like a chess tournament, to all intents and purposes, except it wasn't chess. These were board games, but not chess board games. So it was very interesting uh, just to see how um, they can be utilized in such a way. And I think the question is always, open as to whether or not <coughs> if we wanted really to get the benefits of mathematical games that perhaps 
chess may not be the only answer. Maybe we'll be looking at some of these other games, the sort of games that uh, are promoted in Portugal. And I think that is a very interesting idea to, to consider doing something <coughs> similar in, in, you know, in, in other countries. Uh, <coughs> and <coughs> what we want as well here is uh, we, we always want to play games, classroom games, that the teachers are comfortable with. I mean, teachers, of course, are very busy and a lot of pressure. They don't want to do anything too difficult outside of their comfort zone. So you're not, you don't want to tell teachers, oh, <coughs> you must learn chess, you know, like in a serious way, because they all, everybody knows chess is a difficult game, so you can't force ch teachers to, to learn this. And that, we, we wouldn't do that. I mean, that, that would not be the correct way to, to go about it. <coughs> so we have to make the assumption that we can only play games where the, where the teachers, who are the most important elements in this, are comfortable to play the games. That is to say, they don't need to know a lot in terms of the rules of the games. Uh, it's something that they can pick it up fairly quickly. And of course, uh, we're always looking for um, problems that are fun and exciting, activities that the children enjoy. <coughs> um, so I've used the term chess and mathematics a couple of times, but actually they are connected, you could say, by one more, more fundamental uh, concept, which is problem solving, which is an all-purpose generic concept. And um, if you read the mathematics curriculum for the United Kingdom, at least when I last read it <coughs> a small number of years ago, it said mathematics was a large, well, a big element of mathematics about problem solving. So, okay, great, you know, problem solving. <coughs> um, so, do teachers uh, set children lots of problems <laughs> that uh, they expect the children to spend a lot of time solving? No. Do, do exams for children contain a lot of problems that, that would require a lot of time to solve? No, not really. And that is because our, uh, our education system is tuned in, of course, to ensure that children learn the minimum necessary in order to solve particular types of problems which are prescribed. And so we all know this. We all know that um, uh, the, the, it can reach the stage that there is a restriction on the uh, the types of technique that you're allowed to use in arithmetic, say, like when you're multiplying large numbers together and like three-digit numbers, you can only use one one approach, which I think is a very prescriptive approach to mathematics. But I can see it makes life a lot easier for the teachers because it's the, the way to do it, the official way of doing that that calculation. <coughs> but that rather goes against the idea that there are different ways to solve problems and different more than one way to solve a mathematical problem. Uh, anyway, so, so let's take a look at Singapore then, because it's quite interesting. Uh, Singapore, which is quite high up on the PISA tables, if in fact it's not number one for mathematics, um, they, they adopted a different, pro different approach. They were explicitly oriented, orientated towards problem solving. And so, <coughs> as I understand it, what happens with the Singapore method of teaching mathematics, which has now got widespread currency, is that um, not only do you have a mathematical problem, but you also are given suggestions as to how you might solve that problem. So there are a number of problem-solving techniques that you would uh, need to be aware of. Uh, for example, starting at the end and working back to the beginning is a very typical concept in problem solving. Um, and so this is quite, uh, I think this is a very powerful method of teaching people <coughs> how to learn themselves because they get practice in learning how to apply problem solving techniques to particular situations, particular mathematical problems. So if this applies to mathematics, of course, it also applies in chess. So what we want to do is give a series of problems to children that 
need to be solved in maybe di different types of ways, but we assist the children in working through these, these different methods. <coughs> um, so what happens in practice, uh, as we've been, this is an evolving subject, chess and mathematics, is that you can see it in one of two ways. You could say chess and mathematics is about, in, in a mathematics class, you would say, uh, oh, we've got a new subject for you now. Um, it's quite fun, it's called chess and maths, and we're going to give you some problems that you can solve. And um, uh, it give, it's fun to solve them, and you might learn something as well. And so that's mathematics enrichment. You might want to do that with children who are quite um, advanced, maybe the very gifted children. You might need to give them a bit more to, to think about. Uh, on the other hand, <coughs> another aspect is that there are people who teach chess, and the people who teach chess uh, may have, uh, may, they may, they always need to deliver a variety to the children because in every class, that, every class that you teach, you need to be always aware. It can't be like the last class; it can't always be the same format because the children get bored with it. So you also have to do something different. So. You need to um, add variety, differentiate, and introduce some other different types of uh, uh, lessons during the, during the class. So you've got these two dimensions to chess and mathematics and practice. <coughs> that photograph, by the way, was taken in uh, Riga, Latvia. And uh, it's, a, it's a problem where the problem itself is defined on the, on the mobile phone, they had to construct a position. So, so I should imagine that one way to deliver material in the classroom would be, uh, as far as this domain is concerned, you know, just popping up, pop it up on the mobile phone. And indeed, that's been at the back of our minds when developing this material. So it's not, it uh, doesn't involve books or look, pieces of paper there, pieces of paper, you know, we're not, we don't need to deliver the exercises like this so much. Um, so, moving on then. <coughs> uh, so, I'm just going to give an arbitrary name, chess maths, to this area of activity. And it is a collection of mathematical problems and games that use the chess board and all the chess pieces as its medium. What you will see is missing from that definition, which is cru crucial, is it is not about chess. So it doesn't imply you need to know what checkmate or stalemate means. You don't need to know chess concepts, zoom swing. You don't, well, I mean, it's useful to know these concepts, of course, but uh, you, don't, you, you, know, you don't need to know them. You, so you don't need to be a chess player to solve these problems. That's the <coughs> special thing. So imagine, you know, you see these positions here, People say, ah, oh, it's a chess problem, isn't it? Because it's on an 8 by 8 grid. But uh, on the other hand, uh, <coughs> it, it doesn't have to be a chess problem. So we are, but, but we are, in effect, constraining ourselves to operate on an 8 by 8 grid, primarily because 8 by 8 is a very common format uh, that you can get in all classrooms, you can get in the shops, in the mm, stores. Uh, eight by eight. If you say I would like to play a game on a seven by seven or a nine by nine or a thirteen by thirteen, uh, then people say, "Oh well, you know, it's a bit expensive. We haven't got any of those. We have to order them." You know, so so eight by eight it is. You know, also eight by eight is quite useful. It's quite useful. Um, so what do you need to know? <coughs> um, well, there isn't a lot you need to know, really. You need to know something about the chessboard, you know, the names, ranks and, ranks and files, every square's got a name, how the pieces move and capture. Moving and capturing doesn't mean you know how to play chess, you just know how to move a piece. As we will see, uh, the rules don't have to be those that are followed by chess. Uh, how do you control a square, attack a piece? What is the value of the pieces? And uh, in these problems, you, it doesn't 
usually matter if it's black or white, only if they, you know, black and white are concepts that are important if you're talking about uh, competition, adversarial relationships. But um, uh, often we're just interested in some characteristics of the movement of the piece. Uh, okay, so. So uh, after a lot of um, what you might call uh, well research and investigation and testing out and um, looking at databases and the internet and old books and talking to people who are experts, we came up with 50 exercises. Of course we looked at many, many more than this, but maybe these 50 are enough because they are quite uh, instructive as they stand. They have a lot of information in them. There we go. Uh, <coughs> so <coughs> what, are the, what are the problems? I, I'll just give you a quick view. I've actually got an got a example here. This is, a, this is a, an example of a book which has got this this is them, so that's coming from this. So this is just a set of the exercises. I'm about to show you. Okay, so <clears throat> some of these are classical, some of them are modified classical, uh, some of them are even new. Some of them new. A lot of them were new to me. Uh, and so I'm happy to say, you know, I've got, I got suggestions from various places, from, uh, uh, how, do you, how do you say? I think if you're in this domain, you're very interested in puzzles or exercises that children like, and then you collect it, you say, ah, oh, they like this one, so we make a note of this and we use it again. Um, <coughs> yeah, so, I think one of my favorite ones was, uh, I'm not, I'm not talking about it today, but, <coughs> Pythagorean checkmate. It's the only, it's the only problem which involves checkmate, or indeed any any chess concept. I just felt we should have it in there because it's so closely connected to Pythagoras' theorem. <laughs> um, but anyway, this is, I could say, an initial draft of 50 exercises, and this is an output from uh, the, the stage of the project called Intellectual Output One. So intellectual output one is where we uh, present the problems to be considered. Um, the next stage, which is intellectual output three, I don't know what happened to two, but uh, number three is the solutions to these. How do we solve these? How do we present these? Uh, in a way that teachers can explain. So let's take a look at uh, I'm just going to give you an example of what some of these things are, just to show you, <coughs> you know, what, what's important. So, uh, it's quite useful if you're discussing a space to give names to different parts of the space. And where you have a grid, it's very convenient to describe the grid in a way that uh, uh, it can be determined according to an index. Um, uh, horizontally and vertically and you might have I think when, when I first looked into this teachers would say oh it's too difficult for children uh, but I tried it out and children didn't have any difficulty at all in learning this stuff I mean it was even young children found it quite easy you probably find the same yourself um, and then they would say well if they can do this it helps them without reading a map when they're studying geography I think this is correct Anyway, so you go on from this, um, and then let's say uh, exercise number two. Exercise number two is an example of um, a couple of things. One is, um, and this kind of embraces the method of how do you teach. What uh, part of understanding a space and the characteristics of that space? Um, here is, you notice this has got a checkerboard pattern, black, white, black, white. Now chessboards did not always have a checkerboard pattern, that's relative, you know, it's re that's a, there's a known date in history when that, when that happened. Um, and 
uh, there is a certain significance to, to this pattern. And we can help to think about these patterns by asking questions. So typically you would say, uh, what is the color of a particular square? And uh, so the, um, the teacher, and this is where it gets interesting for the children, because the teacher is going to take a risk. And when teachers take a risk, children are interested. And you say to the class, call out any square you want, and I will give you the name of that square. So call out square. G5. G5. Right, got no idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So I, I mean, so I would uh, I would then give an answer, right? I mean, I'm not giving an answer, but this I'll give an answer, and uh, then the class is suitably impressed that I've given the answer, and then uh, and then you get them to come. You know, some volunteer children they come out to the front, and in doing that they begin to visualise the the board. Some children are able to visualize the board very well indeed. And one of the characteristics about um, chess players who become quite strong chess players is they're usually quite good at visualization, which is quite, you know, quite interesting. Um, and uh, there, are various, there are various techniques for learning these, um, these types of patterns that are. That's part of the, you know, the write-up, as it were, you know, uh, to do this. But it does seem um, that even though it's a simple question, what colour is the square, um, you have to do a certain amount of mental calculations in order to come up with the answer. And I think this is the interesting thing uh, about all of these exercises. It's the mental activity that needs to take place before it. <coughs> of course, we can't discuss this topic without doing some chess and arithmetic. And you will be familiar with uh, this type of uh, calculation. And in fact, I think uh, uh, a number of uh, websites and chess teaching businesses actually kind of major on this, as if this is just a mathematics. And I think it's good, uh, <coughs> up to a point. And here I'll just, <coughs> I'll just interject with a, an observation. So you have to stop me if uh, we're going to go too long, but um, quite often people say um, that, math that um, chess is only good for learning mathematics if you can have a one-to-one -one relationship between the chess and the mathematics. So here's a one-to-one -one relationship, you know, between, so that's knight is three, rook is five, and the pawn is one. There's a one-to-one -one relationship. Now I have to ask you, do you think that doing that calculation is going to be uh, more effective in learning mathematics than doing a calculation if that was, for example, an apple and an orange and a banana. It would, is it any more powerful? Um, I suggest not. So in other words, I think there's a limit to how far you can go in just replacing one symbol by another symbol. And although it has a certain curiosity value, I don't I'm not convinced it's got any uh, instructional value. I'd like to see if, if, some, if there's somebody thought that it did work. It might work for children who play chess, as you said, they like working in chess games, so they have yeah. to add numbers together. To yeah. Play yeah. Yeah, but in general. Just by the answer, yeah. but in general, no. Yeah, because I think what we have to be aware of here is that we're dealing with children who are not necessarily chess players, it's kind of all kids somehow, but, yeah. To teach the numerals is already difficult by itself. Yeah, yeah, so maybe, uh, maybe it has some, some advantages. Uh, no, I'm not against it, I think it's, but it's not the only thing, is it? I say, of course you should do this tough example, but it's not the only thing. Okay, so, um, here's another nice one, I think. Uh, because <coughs> a lot of, you could say, a lot of um, science is about categorization. So you need to categorize things all the time. Well, okay, why not categorize chess pieces? Well, that, that is a real exercise because uh, there isn't a, 
there isn't just one way to categorize chess pieces, there's probably many, many ways to categorize chess pieces. And people, I mean, people may or may not know, but the chess pieces, at least in the Staunton pattern, they do have um, a sort of uh, an ascending order of size. And I think this is quite, uh, uh, this is quite interesting, as is the patterns on the top of the pieces, which denote how they move. Uh, it's not clear if people know that. But in any event, there are numerous ways to classify pieces. Uh, and I think that's an exercise in creativity, imagination, uh, classification and ordering of pieces. Okay, jumping ahead a bit. Number nine, NIM. <coughs> so I've depicted this uh, on a chessboard simply to make it uh, as part of the category of uh, one of the chess maths games. So in this game here, players take turns to remove one or more counters from the end of any rank. So you may have seen this game with matchsticks or, or something. So if, if I go first, I can remove all of these, or I can remove maybe one of those, one of those, I can, but I can, on my move, I can only remove a red counter from just one rank. Uh, would, any, would anybody like to say what the winning move here is? Or is there a winning move? Who, who wins? The first person or the second person? It's the first, first person. person. First person. First person wins. Right. Um, okay, but the people who have answered this are mathematicians. So, what about any non-mathematicians? How, how, how would you answer this question? It's not obvious, is it, really? It's not obvious. It's not obvious unless you know how to solve it. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, I think it's a case of, uh, if you play the game a few times, you might win sometimes, you might lose sometimes. Uh, and you might kind of have a feel for it. But there is, there is a definite way of figuring out if you're winning or losing on this game. Uh, now, I mean, the interesting thing is, <coughs> it doesn't have very many pieces in it, this game. Has it? It's only got... Um, ten. Ten? Yeah, yeah ten pieces. So, uh, you know, and the actions are only adding and removing. So, how would you set about <coughs> um, solving a problem like that? Now, <coughs> it probably... Only very few people could kind of figure out the theory without a lot of help. Um, so I think it's worthwhile um, understanding that the main thing for me is that, that you can, you can uh, learn how to solve situations like this immediately by looking at them. You know? There's a certain calculation that you can do. And, uh, okay, so that, now this, why I'm mentioning this is that this game, NIM, is quite fundamental. It's so, okay, it's got to do with counters. Uh, what's it got to do with uh, uh, chess or something? <coughs> well, before I get onto that, I just uh, show you, I show you this position here. What is the relationship between uh, this, well, this position and the previous position? Hmm? Yeah, I mean, basically, it's uh, it's not identical, but, but 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 the idea is here. You you can you have a choice of moves you can make. You can move one or two here, right? But in this game here, what you're doing, you're doing the same thing, but you're it's you're looking at the gaps by moving that. Uh, one to the to the left, you reduce the gap from three to two. So, if you had put counters in here, imagine you put blue counters in there, uh, you could replace the green and the red by just blue counters in here. So this is logically equivalent to the previous game. Now, people won't necessarily realise that's the case. <laughs> um, but uh, I suggest that understanding that these are identical, logically, 
is part of um, a process of understanding that there's an underlying pattern. This is just, uh, I'm not going to give any solutions here Aww. because. <laughs> no, I'm giving no solutions here um, because uh, we're just talking here about setting the problems. The solutions are uh, for the stage three of the project, you know, so we, we don't talk about this. But all I, all I want to show is that what, if I show these to chess players, do you know what chess players are? These are trivial, right? They say they're trivial, right? Look at, I don't even need to look at this, it's so simple. But of course they haven't looked at it and they don't know actually how simple it is or not. But it looks simple, doesn't it? Uh, how about this then? <coughs> so this is just, yet again, another transformation of the game. But this time we're using rooks. People say, ah, oh, I know where the rook is, it moves from side. But we're using rooks which move horizontally, not vertically, in this case. So, um, so the, the rooks can slide. Uh, who wins, the first player or the second player? So how do you win? The winning condition, the last person to move is the winner. The last person to move is the winner. So... Second player will win. Second player will Right, again, our two mathematicians in the room give the answers. Uh, but do you know why, why that is the case? It takes time. It, it yeah. takes time. It, it takes time. It takes time. It's, a, it's an argument from symmetry, in effect. <laughs> um, now, concepts such as symmetry and other ones, parity, when we look at the black and white, are very important concepts. And once you suddenly grasp these concepts, you can see them everywhere. But if you didn't know about symmetry and parity, then you would go through life not, uh, not understanding that there's some inner beauty to a lot of what's going on. So, um, again, this is another absolutely trivial game, but it's actually in effect got a, got a name because it was considered by mathematicians or game theorists many, many years ago. And so you have a queen here and um, the queen, the first person to get the queen down to A1 is the winner. And the thing is, both players play the same piece. Both players play the same piece. Now, how is that going to how is that going to work out? Who's going to win that? Now, uh, I put this to um, some children. They played it for a while. They said it's easy. You know how to win this game. That's the end of it. Right. Uh, that's true. It is. It is an easy game. But but the thing is that the value in this game is understanding the underlying uh, patterns which make this game um, instantly, you might say, s solved. Because once you see the pattern, you know exactly whether one person is winning or losing. And you say, well, how can that be? You know, you can move anywhere. And then you think a bit like uh, if I move to A and they move to B and I move to C. You can think of those terms, but that's not how you would solve this. So I'll just give you these examples. Um, we could complicate it further by doing the two queens. Uh, shall I talk about that? And here is one of my favourites, which I'm not <coughs> going to, to dwell on too much, but I'm just going to ask here. It's rook on a1. I wanted to um, I wanted to arrive up there in the red spot, but I wanted to cover all of the squares on the board. Uh, can you can you give me the route it must take to do that? Say that to class. Now I'll tell you. Uh, not, I'm not going to inflict this on you, but I'll tell you the reaction when I give this to adult classes uh, of teachers. And the reaction is some they they try it for a while, and after a while they say <coughs> I haven't figured it out yet, but I know you can do it and they insist you can do it, and they, they'll take it home with them and they'll let me know the answer. That's what, <laughs> uh, that's what they say. Um, I don't think anybody has said it's impossible because the mindset is not there to say that this is impossible. It is impossible, by the way. So, um, and you think, well, how can something like that be impossible? Surely I can go anywhere I want. You know, I'm, 
I'm a free person. I can like walk over there to the church. I can walk over to the shopping centre to the tube. I can do anything. You know? Why can't they go from there to there? Well, because you have to cover all the squares on the board. This is a bit of a constraint. Um, so uh, it imposes certain restrictions on what you can do. So I just want to give you a flavour of some of the very simple ones. And uh, if we move now into, <coughs> I mean, a nice thing about these problems is that we use a chessboard eight by eight, but then in addition we can use coloured counters or simple objects like a, a domino. So a domino two by one size. And the question is, can this domino cover this board? What do you think? Anybody? If I had uh, if I had 32 dominoes, can they cover the board? Yes. Yes. I don't know who that was. Ah, it's another international master. <laughs> yes. No, the the dominoes can cover the board. Yeah, they can cover the board. But it's not so difficult to see that because imagine if you can imagine things moving in space. But imagine that was on A1 and, and B1, and then the next another one of those is on C1 and D1. And we can see, can reach the end fairly happily. And then if they reverse uh, ends, then you can fill each of the rows in the same way. So we, we can see that this works, visually, I think. But now if we move on to um, how these problems work, you start with a simple case, and then you slightly complicate it and see what happens. Let's say we take off the corner, corners of the board. Uh, so I ask the same question. Uh, can the dominoes, we only need 31 this time, supposedly, can the dominoes cover that board, or the squares on the board? What do you think? No. No. Why, why not? Because twice the black are uh, Yeah. Moved. Yeah, uh, <coughs> so, uh, yeah, because this is a black square, and that's a black square that's been removed. Um, but a domino is always black and white. It's always black and white. So uh, we, we, we were trying to squeeze, how, however we might operate with, the, with these dominoes, we will find that the, um, it's not possible to squeeze it in. Now, I mean, it may be necessary to actually get some dominoes to try it out on the chessboard, actually get the dominoes and see how, how far you can get. This question was actually an entrance exam question to Oxford, Uni <coughs> Oxford University once, I remember. You know who first proposed this question? Who? John von Neumann. came from him. The uh -huh. inventor of computer science. Aha, uh -huh. yes. There you are, computer science question. Um, now, as it happens, I think this is, what, this is an example of, uh, of a problem that went viral uh, many years ago. So every, I think everybody should know this problem. I don't know what you think, but uh, everybody should know this problem, but they don't. But uh, a lot more people know that there's a, there's a problem here and that you, you can't do it. It's something to do with this being black and that being black and white, so it can't be done. Uh, but it's quite an interesting exercise to study this and see, well, why is that the case? What's going on here? Uh, so that's dominoes. Uh, this is, a, this is a problem I tried, well actually in 2014 when we had the conference here I, I raised this. Uh, you've got a chessboard, you can see it's, it's broken into 16 squares. Uh, and you say, okay, two by two, but can, can you partition a chessboard into 16 squares, which are of, um, none of which are two by two? So you, you're not allowed to do the same pattern as this. Can you do it? Are you allowed to use two by two squares? And, and yeah, better. yeah, yeah, yeah. Show it two other ways than doing it by two by two. And this is a really nice problem because it has to do with, um, uh, in mathematics terms, you're adding up squares. So this is, uh, you know, two squared plus two squared plus two squared plus two squared. So 16 by two squared, which gives us 64. Um, but uh, it's, quite, it's quite a problem to figure out how do you 
how do you come up with a calculation where you have x squared plus y squared plus z squared, etc., equals 64? So that's what that uh, aspect is. Anyway, um, so this is an example, you know, this is a geometrical problem, a timing problem, which um, I think, uh, again, is, is this lends itself very well to classroom exercises with scissors and paper and things like this. It's really good for the classroom. Um, and we, uh, we have good feedback on that. I think a certain number of puzzles in chess and mathematics are, in effect, uh, they're classic. And this is, this is classic going back to the 18th century. <coughs> Um, where you have uh, a chessboard with eight queens, you have to rearrange the queens so that no two queens attack each other. Uh, I think it's uh, it's surprisingly it's a, it's, a, it's a, in a way it's a surprisingly difficult problem because there's no there's no uh, solution method to doing other than trial and error. Uh, but you can do this in a systematic way. But it's not as if there was some sort of this is one of a few examples that we're dealing with where there's no kind of magic formula for doing it. Anyway, that's 39. I think another fantastic problem is how many squares on the chessboard. Uh, I assume you all know the answer. And it's not 64. <laughs> okay. Um, I just want to show this very briefly. Uh, power contours. You, this is the idea that each piece can be represented by the number of squares that it attacks. So for example, the rook, it attacks 14 squares. So uh, we can use green as the color code here. But let's say I gave you a space which had some color codes on it, like this. Then, let's, can we work the other way around? What is the piece that is depicted by that? I think this is, this is fine uh, when they're chess pieces. But we can also have other types of pieces as well. But we won't get into that at the moment. I'll just skip that. Uh, I'll skip that. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you, you can have, this is more statistical analysis, but you can have lots of, um, lots of different types of problems that, that are manifested in a, in a, on a chessboard. So just to summarize then, next stage of the project, the stage three, is we need um, feedback on these uh, um, exercises from teachers and from children, because we want to know what happens in the classroom when you present this to children. What's the best way of presenting it to, to children? Whoops. Um, how do you classify the exercises? Because another big issue we have is, are some more difficult than others? Or should some be solved in groups? Should, we, should some be competitive or uh, collaborative, you know, a lot of things. And what sort of solving methods? So there's different ways of analysing these uh, when, we, when we present the final, final report. <coughs> um, and I heard that the talk in the preliminary session about we need to have more languages. Well, the good thing about this project, at least, is uh, this, we've had this already translated into several languages. Of course, I don't know what these languages are. Um, but uh, I suspect uh, we're looking at um, Spanish and uh, there was Portuguese and Spanish and uh, Slovak. So we now have uh, something to present to the classrooms, to the teachers that they can, that they can work with. And how they present it will be very interesting to, to, to discover. I do have some <coughs> sorry. I do have some printouts of these um, these exercises here. So um, you know, it's probably enough for everybody is here. <coughs> but you, I mean, if you're from one of the partners, you probably just print it off yourself. Okay, I just uh, I think that's it. Is it? Yeah. I just leave it there. Okay. Sorry for going on a bit long, but I hope I gave you an overview of uh, what the project's about and the content of it. <coughs> and, uh, what we're trying to do. <coughs>